Our featured speaker this afternoon is Morris Glass. Mr. Glass and his family were forced into a Nazi ghetto when he was 11 years old. That's, most, that's younger than most of us in here. After four years there, his family was moved to Auschwitz. Raise your hands if you've ever heard of that. Okay, so quite a few. Upon their arrival at Auschwitz, he and his family, and he and his father and his brother were separated from his mother and his sisters, and he never saw his sisters nor his mother again. Today, Mr. Glass is going to share his powerful story with us. So, without further ado, I'll turn the stage over to Mr. Glass. I was born and raised in Pabianice, Poland, a city of about 70,000 with 12,000 Jews. I was brought up in a Jewish observing home. I was the youngest of four children. My father was quite well-to-do. He owned a huge textile mill. And we lived what was then considered a luxury apartment with a bathtub and a toilet, which was very few of them in our city. I was a very active child. I played a lot of, uh, an awful lot of sports, mainly soccer. I had a very loving and caring family, and I had a very, very happy childhood. And all this came to an end on September the 1st, 1939. Can you hear me okay? At which point, about a week or so after the war began, the German army occupied our city. The first thing they did is they burnt down our main beautiful Jewish synagogue with all the holy scriptures and the praying shawls and everything in it. And then they used it as a stable for the horses. The telephones and the radios were confiscated and then we were ordered to give up all the books in our possession. In fact, we threw them out through the window and we were burning them in the streets. A short while later, a Jewish ghetto was formed. So we were forced to live in a few square blocks in the old city. And we had to share our apartments with all the Jewish people who lived outside of those few square blocks. Unlike we here in the United States of America, which is the greatest country in the universe, most of us over here live in one family homes. In Europe, 95% of the people live in apartments. If somebody owns a one family home, it's considered like a palace. So take this under perspective. I know it's very difficult for you to hear the story that I'm just about to tell because you were so fortunate and so privileged to live free in this greatest country on earth. After the ghetto was formed, we were all forced to work for the German Nazi machine, producing many very, very valuable items for the Germans. And what kept us going is the fact that we were still with our family and, of course, our faith. And this too came to an end on May the 14th, 1942, when the ghetto and Pabianitz were liquidated, at which point we were ordered to march to this huge uh, sports complex when out of nowhere, there were hundreds of SS stormtroopers who took over. And the selections were made. And the elderly, and the sick, and the children were taken away. There was a pile of little infants laying five or six high, crying the little heart out. Then there was a group of, of all the children and the elderly, 
the crying, the pleading, and the begging was going on for hours. Eventually, they were all taken away, never to be seen again. And the rest of us, the able bodies, were sent to the Lodge ghetto. Now, Lodge, was that, of course, the name was changed during the war because the, the German Nazis, believing that the Third Reich would last a thousand years, Germanized a lot of the big cities. And Lodz was the second largest city in Poland with a population of 750,000 and almost a quarter of a million Jews. So Lodz was changed during the war to Litzmannstadt, was named after a very famous SS general. So geographically, Lodz was not far from our city of Pabianice, but Lodz Ghetto was a million miles different, and it was a different world compared to where we were the ghetto in Pabianice. Lodz was surrounded by barbed wire, and every 80 or 100 yards there was SS stormtrooper watching us day and night. In Lodz Ghetto, there were anywhere between three and 400 people dying every single day from hunger and from disease, mainly hunger. Hunger, real hunger, is a terrible thing. It's almost impossible to describe. In the large ghetto, we were all forced to work. If you didn't work, you didn't get any rations. And large ghetto was very famous for producing an incredible amount of very valuable items for the German Nazis. We, we produced, we made furniture, we made civilian clothing, and uniforms, and shoes, and boots, and needles, and nails, and Two of the very important items for the German Nazis was, it was uh, a huge factory with about a thousand teenage girls working there, and they were making straw shoes. At that time, Germany was already at war with Russia, so they were sent to the German front, and the German soldiers, soldiers wore it on top of the boots to prevent them from frostbite. Two other items that we made in the large ghetto were ski masks that they, they, they needed because the winters in, in uh, Russia are very brutal, and earmuffs. And despite the fact that we produced all that, they gave, it, they gave us so little food. And again, what kept us alive is the fact that we were still with our families and, of course, our incredible faith. And this too came to an end at the beginning of the summer of 1944 when the orders came to liquidate the large ghetto. At which point we were all taken into cattle cars and we were on our way south into Auschwitz. After a few days we uh, arrived in Auschwitz as we disembarked in the cattle cars the men were ordered to go to the right. The women went to the left. I saw my mom and my two sisters. I waved to them, and I never saw them again. <laughs> my father, my brother, and myself continued to walk towards the infamous Dr. Mengele, better known as the Angel of Death, which was in charge of the selections. My father went first, then my brother, and when it came my turn, he sort of hesitated, because I was nothing but a skinny kid. What really saved me is the fact my father worked in a clothing distribution center in the large ghetto, and he brought me to see a plaid coat with huge, with, with huge shoulder pads. And I wore that coat. And, and that coat really made me look like I was a man, but I was nothing but a skinny little kid. 
After much hesitation, he let me go through. We continued to march towards the showers. We came in. It was a huge room. We were to to totally undressed. Our heads were shaven. The underarms were disinfected. And then we were given a pair of striped pants and a shirt. And we walked outside. I tried to find my father. I looked around, I couldn't find him. My father was standing right next to me. I didn't recognize my own father. This man aged 30 years in those few hours because he realized where we found ourselves. I guess I was just too young to comprehend Auschwitz. How can one possibly describe Auschwitz? Auschwitz is miles of concentration camps, surrounded by high voltage electric wire. And every hundred feet or so, there's a tower, an assessment mounting a machine gun. Auschwitz. Auschwitz was a place when there were thousands came in from, from every corner of Europe, from as far as Greece, Romania, Hungary, Belgium, Holland, France, and so on, and the selections were made, and the children and the elderly were taken away, and the able bodies were sent into the many hundreds of concentration camps in Germany. Auschwitz. In addition of sending thousands to their death every single day, the infamous Dr. Mengele, better known as the Angel of Death, was also in charge of the most heinous, brutal, and sadistic experiments during the Second World War, starting with partial and radical castrations and the finest specimen of man. I bunked with two of them, and I saw them naked. It, it just broke my heart. And the women, I saw them when I went by them the experiment block, the heads shaven, the faces marred with excruciating pains, walking on all fours, not even the slightest resemblance to a human being. And the children, the favorite of Dr. Mengele was to break rifle butts on the heads of the children to see how many it would take until the brain is totally shot at. Auschwitz. Auschwitz had four huge crematoriums operating 24-7. And the smell or the stench of burning human flesh is so distinct that it cannot be confused with anything else. And many a days when I looked up in the chimney and saw the smoke Blanching out, I wondered whose turn was it next. My aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my friends, Auschwitz. My brother was taken away to a concentration camp in northern Germany. And it was on the eve of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is the holiest holiday for the Jewish people. And the German Nazis were very well aware of that because there were always hangings or shootings or killings. And it was on the eve of Yom Kippur that the SS stormtroopers came in into our, into our camp. Our camp was called Tsigaynalage. That means the, the gypsy camp. And the reason it was called uh, the gypsy camp, because prior to us coming into Auschwitz, there were 35,000 Romas in, in that camp. And in order to make room for the Jewish people, for the Jewish men from large ghetto, they were all taken to the guest chambers crematorium and they were all killed. But their name remained Tsigayna Lager. So they came in on that eve and they demanded 700 teenagers. My sister's boyfriend, who had some privileges in this block, realized what was going on he very quickly threw me under his bunk and he covered me with a blanket. The reason I said he was very privileged because he had a, a bunk 
We slept on the bare concrete, whatever we stand, stood, or whatever, that's where we slept. No, no pillows, no blankets, nothing. My father was not aware of what was going on. And when he saw me in the morning when this was over, after they routed up those 700 teenagers and they were marching towards the guest chambers, crying and pleading. When they saw me, when my father saw me in the morning, went over to me, gave me a big hug and a kiss, and he says to me, Morris, this is pure hell. We must get out of here. And as I was telling you, there were daily transport sent into the many hundreds of concentration camps in Germany. We very quickly registered, and we were on our way in, in a cattle car into it, Germany. After a few days, we came in into a camp called Kaufering, which was a satellite of Dachau. After a couple of weeks, we were transferred to another concentration camp called Kaufbeuren, which also is a satellite of Dachau. Now, Kaufbeuren was considered by the German Nazi as a Vernichtungslager. That means a camp of destruction. To try to describe the conditions in Kaufbeuren is almost humanly impossible, but they woke us up in the morning. We don't know what time it was. All I can tell you is that when we left the camp it was pitch black and we came back it was, it was dark, it was black. So we don't know how many hours we were outside. In the morning we were given what they considered coffee. It was like actually Imita imitation coffee made from the shells of corn. They, burn, they burned them and that's where they gave us coffee. And we marched several miles into uh, the place of, uh, where we worked, my father and I. We, we were given the job of working with a pick and shovel digging foundation. It's hard for me to believe because I don't think my father ever held a hammer in his hand, but that's what we were assigned to, that's what we did. At lunchtime, which was the biggest meal of the day, we were given a soup made of peels of potatoes, but it was hot, it was delicious. We came home at night, and we were given a slice of bread, which was most of the time old and moldy, and a little piece of margarine. My father and I slept in the same bunk. And my father kept talking to me. Anyway, he got sick and he no longer could, could go to work. So he stood behind in, in, in the bunk. And at night, he was, he was telling me that he used to get beatings almost every day. But there were no marks on his face or his body. They knew exactly how to hit you without leaving any marks. And he was telling me that they wanted him to go to the sick block. And he knew once he goes into the sick block, the most a day that you can really, it was, it's impossible to describe the conditions there. So he was hoping that he will regain his strength and will feel better. I can stand here and tell you a thousand stories. Because I was in the camps and in the ghettos from the very beginning to the very end. But this one story in particular, it's sort of related. In the morning, when we, the, uh, when we after we uh, got ready to go to work, we were all counted, and then we made a report, and when we came back from work, it was the same thing. And I just remember when the, the report figure, when he gave, uh, when he spoke to the, to, to the commander of, of the, uh, the German commander of the camp, I just remember him saying, nicht genug, that means whatever debt there was, was never enough. So this one evening when we came back from commando, and they counted us, we were told to take off our shirts. And my friend, Laszlo, was a Hungarian Jew, 
he worked in a quarry and he got a hold of a piece of cement paper from a cement sack and he wore it on, the, on his body to keep him a little warmer. For this, the camp commander beat him to death. It was the, the, the next day or so when they came in into our block and they dragged my father from his bunk. I followed him. I want to see they were taking him to the shack. And I stood there in total disbelief when they were pulling the teeth from his mouth. His body was still warm. You see, in those days in Europe, when somebody needed a crown, it was made from gold. So, to pay the final respect to my father, I volunteered for the burial commando that nobody really wanted to do. And the burial commando consisted of four men in a blanket, and we took five or six bodies and put them in there. We marched outside the camp. There was a huge pit, and two of them let go, and, and the bodies just fell into the, to the, to the pit, the mass grave. We repeated it five or six different times until everybody was buried, and we, I came back into the block. And the block helped us then. The man in charge of, the, of our block says to me, what are you doing here? How come you didn't go for your regular work, Commander? And I told him, we just finished. I worked for the burial, Commander. And he says, I shouldn't have done it because they're shorthanded. And for this, I'm going to get 50 lashes on my behind. So the way that until everybody came, came back from work and everybody was ordered to attend, in fact, the German camp commander came in to watch that. And they pulled me over the table, they put down, pulled down my pants, at which time the German commander says, no film fancy, only 25 lashes because I'm a teenager. But the truth is that after the first few, you're sort of numb. But I still have the scars to prove it. After they were done, my friends dragged me back to the bunk, and somehow they got a hold of some, ra of some rags, and they soaked them in the snow, and they took turns all night long laying compresses. Because they knew, and I knew, come morning, I have to go to work. And I did. I don't know how, but I did. And about two weeks after that, the orders came to liquidate the camp. Originally, there were 1,200 men sent to Kaufbeuren, and we were a group of 350. Out of 1,550 men, we were 118 left, and we were on our way to the infamous Dachau. When we marched into Dachau, we were greeted by uh, the welcoming committee, which consisted of four gallows with men hanging there. We continued to walk through the infamous gate that says, Arbeit macht frei, that means work will set you free. And we continued to walk towards the showers, which were joining the gas chambers in the, concentra in the uh, crematorium. When we came in, we told to undress, and we walked in, and we waited for the water to come out. At that time, we already heard about the infamous cyclone gas that was out of Eichmann's invention. A can for about 49 cents could kill a 1,000 men. So we really didn't know if the water is going to come out because these men were well, very poor shape, to say the least. But water came out, and we took the showers. We were taken into the blocks. A few days later, we were sent to another concentration camp called Mildorf. In Mildorf, I worked at a quarry, and I came down 
I got sick, I came down with dysentery. This is a terrible disease. I mean, you can't keep anything down. It's, it's impossible to describe it. All you really want to do is die. So I was sent into the sick camp, which was, which was adjoining the labor camp. After two or three days, I was okay. It was a miracle. Realizing that nothing good can happen to me if I stay in the, in the sick uh, camp, I came over to the assess officer who was in charge, and I told him, I'm fine. Uh, I want to go back to the labor camp. He said, you can't let me do it because they found typhoid, and therefore the camp is under quarantine. A couple of weeks later or so, we were told that we're going to be sent into a central typhoid camp. And so we were put on the, into the cattle cars, and after they sealed the door, I looked around. These people were half dead. I really thought that this was the end of the line for me. So I said the Shema, which is in the Jewish faith, like the final prayer, and I fell asleep from exhaustion. I woke up in the morning, I looked out to the cracks of the cattle car, there was a camp there. Then my good God, why would I save these people when they killed tens of thousands of healthy men and women? I cannot answer that, but as we disembarked, we went into we came in into the central typhoid camp. By then it was already it was already the spring of 1945. And the orders came of the infamous dead marches. You see, Ada Weichmann had a plan, and he called it the final solution of the Jewish question. And this plan was, and keep in mind that the American army had already landed in Omaha Beach, and they were already on their way to Germany. And his plan, was for all the men and women to march south in Germany to the Austrian-German border. There was a city called Mittenwald, and outside of it there's a huge forest called Tyrol, T-Y-R-O-L. And that would be our final destination, at which point we would be given soup which were poisoned, and by the time the American army would come in, there would be nothing left but a little mountain of ashes. Thank God this plan didn't quite work. When the orders came for the marches, of course, the men in our camp, they, they could hardly stand up the long march. So we were taken, we were put on open coal cars. I guess they must have run out of cattle cars. And we were on our way south in Germany. After a couple of days, right outside of a village called Schwabhausen, I shall never forget it, the, our train came to a stop. And the reason that stopped is because on the adjoining track, there was a huge German flakjug, a military train with anti-aircraft guns, the likes of which I never saw in my life. And so, the Americans came and they were trying to disable that train, and rightfully so, because they were shooting at them. So they shielded themselves with, uh, with, with uh, the people in our train. And so an American came and they as, as careful as they were, not to hurt any of us, there were a lot, an awful lot of casualties. There were body parts staying all over. It, it, it's almost impossible to describe. And they had nothing to give us. There was no medication or anything. And as I was telling you, a lot of them had typhoid. And typhoid, you burn up from high temperature. So somehow, in the afternoon, they allowed us to go to the village, which was like 
maybe a half a mile from where the train was, for water. And there were four of us, and we started to, to, to go on the road to the village to get some water, and the sky turns black, and the heavy rains came. And so the assess st storm troopers, they took shelter in the farmers' houses. And so we just continued to walk and walk and walk until we came in to Santo Tillian, which was a convent, a cloister, a Catholic cloister in Bavaria. As we were laying there in the forest, in the back of this huge building, being I was the youngest, I volunteered to knock on the door. I knocked on the door, the door opened up, there was a nun. I didn't have to say anything. She said to me, come in, my child. And I told her there were three of my friends still in the forest, we came in. I took off our clothes, I can tell you my shirt was saturated with hundreds, thousands of lice. They burned all our clothes, and, they, uh, and I took a bath and hot water and soap. I didn't want to go out in the bathtub. And they gave us a pair of pants and a shirt, and the Bernard brothers came. They took us away, and they hid us. On the morning of April 28th, 1945, they, they came, the Bernard brothers came, they told us that the American army is very close and there might be some shooting. So we'd be much safer in the basement. So they took us down into the basement. I got a hold of an apple uh, cart or an apple crate and I looked out to the little window and I saw the first American tank coming up the hill. How can I possibly explain the jubilation of my heart to know this incredible nightmare was over? And now, 71 years later, and four generations strong, I stand before you a very proud and grateful man, grateful for the opportunity that this great country gave me to start a new life, to raise a family, and to live in freedom and in liberty. I must take this opportunity to thank the members of the American Armed Forces for their heroism, their sacrifices in fighting to liberate Europe to make it possible for me to be here today. To the young people in the audience, I have two requests to make. When you go home, whenever this ends, if you have any siblings, go over to them, give them a hug, and tell them how much you care. And to your parents, give them a big hug and a kiss and tell them how much you love them. Do it for me, please. I wish I had one moment to tell my mom how much I loved her. And it's the future of this country, and indeed the world, is in your hands. It's up to you to make sure that something like that should never happen again, not only to the Jewish people, but to nobody. And in the name of all who perished, and on behalf of the survivors who are no longer with us, I beseech you, never forget the Holocaust. Thank you very much.